Welcome to St. Philip and St. James Church. If you've been looking for this service to start since 10 o'clock, I apologise for the um, delay in the start of the service. Uh, we've had one or two technical issues which we hadn't expected. And even now, we're not sure whether you can hear my voice. But we hope you can. So if somebody can send a message to say, that yes, they can hear my voice. That would be very reassuring for us at this end. And uh, equally, of course, if you if you can't hear anything, uh, then hopefully somebody will have the sense to uh, tell us that also. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn which is, I was about to say the hymn number, 547, O oh God, our help in ages past. <laughs> I have one or two notices. Well, as I'm sure you're aware, we are now back into a form of lockdown, which means that we cannot meet for worship in the church. I want to thank everybody who has worked so hard to make our worship in church safe and possible for these last few months. And for those people who have worked very hard to make this transition to this new way of worshipping together, I want to thank you also, and especially for those who have been involved in our ever-changing plans for Remembrance Sunday. We are now faced for at least four weeks with the task of holding our congregation together and continuing to reach out to our community in love. And for all the work that you're going to do to make that happen, I thank you also. And finally, I want to thank everybody who has responded to our financial appeal, either by making 
donations, large and small, and also by uh, taking part in the sponsored cycle ride and supporting others who have done the sponsored cycle. The money that we have received has removed, lifted from us this year, the financial worries that we had, that we would struggle to make it to the end of the year uh, without um, uh, entering into a deficit. Um, thank you very, very much. This means that we can approach our ministry, even in these difficult times, even when Christmas has an air of uncertainty about it, we can approach our ministry with confidence. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mm. Oh, God. 
Mighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nations divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing the hymn, Abide With Me was so popular at the time of the First World War and in the years immediately afterwards. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them, and the wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When my grandfather retired, my aunt took him on a special trip to Russia. One of the places that the tour guide took them to was the cenotaph outside Moscow, which marks the point which is the closest that the Nazis came to the city in the dreadful winter of 1941. My grandfather had been a soldier in that army although he spent that winter further north, towards Leningrad. The cenotaph had quite a few visitors milling about, and a Russian man realised that this particular group of tourists had come from Germany, and he was quite insistent that he wanted to talk to them. He got into a conversation with my grandfather, which was supported by the interpreting skills of the guide. The conversation ended with an embrace. Both men agreed that peace between people was the most important thing that we should pray for. It's a heavy duty to preach on Remembrance Sunday. 
A few of us have direct experience of war, which we will never forget. And many of us have sacred memories of war, which have been entrusted to us. And these are memories to which we wish to remain faithful. As I try and open up the scriptures for us this morning, I hope that I will do so in a way that is faithful to three things. I pray that in everything I say, I will remember the pain of war, the suffering and fear that people endured, the grief and the guilt of those who survived. This is a pain that unites us. And I pray that I will witness to the yearning of peace, the yearning for peace that we all carry in our hearts. This is a desire that unites us. And I pray that in my preaching, I will remain faithful to Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, who died so that all the sins of the world would be forgiven, who descended into hell and rose again from the dead. To help us in our worship this morning, instead of using the Nicene Creed, I want to use the Apostles' Creed that we normally use in the evening. Because the Apostles' Creed includes this line, He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven. And Paul makes reference to this in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul writes, what does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. We believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he descended into hell, and he descended into hell in order to vanquish death and rescue those who had died and bring them with him when he ascended into heaven. Jesus descended into hell to rescue the dead. But we're very short on details about what happened which is hardly surprising because, of course, there were no living witnesses. And so we are left with a number of options about which to speculate. One option is that Jesus rescued all the dead. He descended into hell and rescued all the dead. So hell is shut down. This may be what we mean when we say that Jesus conquered death. Another option is that Jesus only rescued the righteous from death, and so he left the unrighteous in hell, in which case hell is still open for business. Because if Jesus left people in hell, have new people been added to their number since? The church has often taught that new people have indeed been added to that number. New people have gone to hell, maybe because they have not been followers of Jesus, or maybe because they have done bad things. But we don't quite know. So here's a question that everybody can answer. How would you like it to be? What would you want heaven to be like? What is our vision of heaven? Visions of heaven are all the way through the hymns that we're singing today. In times of suffering, in times of war, people held before them a vision of heaven. So what is our vision of heaven? I want to show you a picture. Somebody sent me this rather beautiful picture. And there's a 14 year old boy who's written a poem inspired by this picture, which has been widely shared in the media. It's a vision of heaven. 
The fighting is over. The soldiers are walking together in ones and twos towards the light. It's a lovely picture, but if you look closely, it's one of those visions of heaven with only some people in it and other people are missing. All the soldiers in this picture are British soldiers. There are no French or German or Russian or Turkish soldiers in this picture. But when I read from the letter to the Ephesians that there is one God and Father of all who is over all, through all and in all, well, we all thought that was right, didn't we? So part of us knows that heaven is not just for us. We know that heaven is for all sorts of people, including people who are not like us. Because Jesus taught us that people who are not like us are people like us. It's a major shortcoming, I think, of Remembrance Day that it is a national memorial day. And this obscures from us a big part of what God is doing in the world. I think I would go as far as to say that Remembrance Day, as it is officially marked, deliberately seeks to obscure what God is doing in the world. We can only glimpse what God is doing in the world when we look beyond the limitations of national remembrance of war. And that seems to me to be the task to which the church is called on this day. In the poem that was written about the picture, the boy wrote that the soldiers had paved a path of peace. So they were good soldiers and I think that means that there are other missing soldiers. Where are the bad soldiers? The ones that destroy peace. Because if all soldiers paved the path of peace when they went to war, there wouldn't really be any need for war, would there? And that is another shortcoming of Remembrance Day. It should be for all soldiers, whichever war they fought in, but actually, people tend to talk about the wars that they are most comfortable talking about. Some soldiers fought and killed and died in wars that, looking back, we wonder whether that was really the best thing to have done. Those wars that, in retrospect, appear to us to have been a mistake. And so we start to exercise a moral discretion which was, of course, denied to the soldiers at the time. So what is it that we want to remember? Who have we put in our vision of heaven? All the people who died in war, or just the soldiers? All the soldiers, or just the British Empire and Commonwealth soldiers? All the British Empire and Commonwealth soldiers? or just the ones who fought the wars that seem right to us today. I want to turn now to our Gospel reading this morning. Our Gospel reading is a vision of heaven and a vision of hell. Now Jesus tells this parable shortly before his crucifixion, shortly before he descends into hell. So shortly before he descends into hell, Jesus gives his followers a vision of heaven and hell. And it's a rather harsh vision, isn't it? The five wise virgins took spare oil with them. They were ready. So they had oil for their lamps, and so they were there when the bridegroom arrived. The five foolish virgins had no spare oil. They were unprepared, 
And so they ran out of oil and went off to get some more, and they were not there when the bridegroom arrived. So far, so good. Seems like we've got the point of this parable. But there are questions, aren't there? Why could the wise bridesmaids not share their oil with their foolish sisters? And why could the bridegroom not let them in when they returned from buying their oil? What vision of heaven is this? What vision of hell is this? I, I had long thought that this parable was about being ready, about being prepared. And the Gospel writer inserts that line at the end as a way of explanation. The line that you don't know the day, you don't know the hour. Make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready. And because this passage comes up once every three years at this time of year, it must be often used at Remembrance Sunday services. I wonder how many sermons over the years have been preached about soldiers being ready, ready to die, ready to kill, bayonets fixed, bombs loaded, ready into the bomb mills. But I don't think that this is what this parable is about. Jesus is going to descend into hell and he's telling this story to leave us with a question. When I descend into hell, do you want me just to get the wise bridesmaids? Do you want me to leave half the people behind? Or do you want me to bring them all into the presence of my Father? And that is the question that faces us this morning. What is the vision of heaven and the vision of hell that we want? Remembrance Day is a day to remember people, to ensure that they are not forgotten. Not just the people whose names are on the list. Not just the soldiers who fought on our side, not just the soldiers who fought the wars that we don't mind remembering. We remember all who died in war. We are, after all, children of one God, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Jesus asks us, Shall I leave the foolish bridesmaids outside? And we reply, no, Jesus, let them all in. Bring them all into the presence of the one God and Father of all. Save them all. We're going to declare our faith now together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our power
power of the Spirit and in union with Christ. Let us pray to the Father. Loving Father, we, we lift before you all the victims of war. We lift before you all the fear and all the hatred in their hearts. We lift before you those who are known to us, who lost their lives in war. We remember fallen comrades. Father, we ask you to welcome them all into your loving arms. To draw them all to your healing life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we ask you to bless the peacemakers, for they are your children. Strengthen the weary hands and make firm the feeble knees. Give them strength and perseverance in their We pray especially for those working for peace in Nagorno-Karabakh. We pray also that the United States of America will find peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our community and especially for those who are fearful and anxious at this time. We pray for households where there is violence, and disagreement and strife of various kinds. We pray for those who have been made unemployed, for those whom the prospect of unemployment or financial ruin is very close. We pray for those who are lonely, who are anxious about how they will make it through the next phase of lockdown. Father, make this church a channel of your grace and peace to your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. Especially those known to us. Those who have asked for our prayer. Send your Holy Spirit to bring strength and comfort where it is needed most. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all those who have died. Those whose sacred memories we cherish. Memories that we pass on to future generations. Father, strengthen in us the faith we have, that they lie in your loving arms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our own discipleship. 
Help us to discern our own calling as peacemakers. Help us to discern our own calling as comforters. Open up before us the path we must take as followers of Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit to accompany us even as we descend into dark places in the name of Jesus, confident of his victory, confident that all your people will be rescued and restored through the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one Spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us offer one another now a sign of peace. So our next hymn What's our next hymn called? 160. Eternal Father, strong to say. Peter's just going to play one more verse of that hymn while I get the uh, altar ready for our Eucharist.
here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living Word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. And therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the we proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Accept through him our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise.
with all who stand before you in earth and heaven. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them all the years condemned. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. ever-living God, we remember those whom you have gathered from the storms of war into the peace of your presence. May that same peace calm our fears, bring justice to all peoples, and establish harmony among the nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share.
draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. God of peace, whose Son Jesus Christ proclaimed the kingdom and restored the broken to wholeness of life, look with compassion on the anguish of the world, and by your healing power make whole both people and nations through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Our final hymn is God is working his purpose.
Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.